So, I need to record something quick uh, before I take a shower and uh, get to my run and errands for the next week. Um, but, like, I also need to get out of video today, and just in time yesterday, a subject came up before my video about Nazi Coke. Um, feel free to check that out. Um, that I wanted to delve in a little bit deeper. And also, <laughs> I didn't have uh, the traction at the time for this subject, but I did have the tra traction for, for Nazi Coke. So, I put that out. So, this is a subject that came up yesterday. <laughs> Uh, written by Sam Biddle at The Intercept. And the subject is that um, Oakland cops hope to arm robots with lethal shotguns. While the official language condoning killer robots is shelled for now, Oakland police are still pursuing the option. So, this is absolutely bad, and you get down to it. Roughly two hours into the meeting, however, this is a meeting that they were having, um, like, sort of a, a kind of joint session here of Oakland police and a bunch of other people. Roughly two hours into the meeting, um, however, the conversation moved on to the Oakland police's stable of robots and their accessories. One such accessory is the gun-shaped percussion actuated non-electric disruptor y you like that it's it's panned percussion actuated non-electric uh, non-electric disruptor a favorite tool of bomb squads at home and at war the pan disruptor affixes to a robot and directs an explosive force typically a blank shotgun shell or pressurized water at suspected bombs, while human operators remain at a safe distance. Picture a shotgun barrel secured to an 800-pound Roomba on tank treads. While describing the safety precautions taken while using the pan disruptor, Daza Kiros told the subcommittee that the department takes special care to ensure that it is in fact a blank round loaded into the robot's gun. This led a clearly bemused Jennifer Tu, a fellow with the American Friends Services Committee and member of the Oakland Police Commission Subcommittee on Militarized Policing, to ask, like, can a live round physically go in, and what happens if a live round goes in? Yeah, physically a live round can go in, Daza Kiros answered. Absolutely, and you'd be getting a shotgun round. After a brief silence... Commissioner Jesse Tsai asks the next question. Does the department plan on using a live round in the robot pan disruptor? The answer was immediately provocative. No, da Daza Kuros said, before quickly pivoting to hypothetical scenarios in which, yes, just a shotgun-armed robot might be useful to police. I mean, it is possible. We have an active shooter in a place we can't get to. And and he's fortified inside a house. Or we're trying to get to a person... <laughs> it soon became clear that the Oakland police were saying what nearly every security agency says when it asks the public to trust it with an alarming new power. We'll only use it in emergencies. But we get to decide what's an emergency. The question of whether robots originally designed for defusing bombs should be converted into remote-controlled guns taps several topics at the center of national debates. Police using uh, lethal force, the militarization of American life, and not least of all, killer robots. Critics of the armed robocops note that the idea of predator drones watching American racial justice protests may have seemed similarly far-fetched in the years before it started happening. It's not that we don't want to debate how to use these tools safely, said Liz O'Sullivan, CEO of the AI Bias Auditing Startup Parity and a member of the International Committee for Robot Arms Control. It's a question of, if we use them at all, what's the impact going to be to democracy? 
Some observers say the Oakland police's robot uh, plan contradicts itself. It's billed as a de-escalation facilitator, but they want to keep it open as a potential lethal weapon. Jamie Omar Yassin, an independent journalist in Oakland who has documented the commission meetings, tweeted, As with any high-tech toy, the temptation to use advanced technology may surpass whatever institutional guardrails the police have in place. Matthew Gariglia, a Policy analyst with the Electronic Frontier Foundation said the ease of use of weapons as well as the dangerous legal precedents justifying the casual use of weapons makes police less likely to attempt to de-escalate situations. So, I thought I'd bring that up because I, I, I've been talking about sort of the robot problem for a while now. And I think it's valuable to bring up that um, the police are making lethal robots. And with all the talk of facial recognition uh, drones having just died down, um, I thought I would bring up a few other things because I think they're interesting connections. So you know how I've been bringing up the fact that the uh, facial recognition super state is currently being built? You know how there are a lot of people who don't believe me? Well, they started to massively enough roll this out in fucking uh, the UK. And the UK isn't quite uh, happy about it, but EFF wrote an article, Ban Government Use of Face Recognition in the UK. Uh, on September 26th, and they brought up the fact that it's been being slowly built, that this is just being built, and the UK has been having to deal with it. And uh, the things have reached a fever pitch there, just to, you know, put it as, as nicely as possible. Um, and... Ultimately, they've gotten very, very strong technology over the last, you know, decade in this regard that basically creates a panopticon uh, around the entirety of the UK and keeps people um, monitored by a state that wants to jail people for Nazi pug jokes. Um... And this, this whole thing talks about how the police use of facial recognition was subject to legal review in an August 2020 court case brought by a private citizen against South Wales police. The Court, uh, the court of Appeal held that the force, force's use of LFR was unlawful insofar it breached privacy rights, data protection laws, and equality legislation. In particular, the court found that the police had too much discretion in determining the location of video cameras and the composition of watch lists. But it says, in light of the ruling, the College of Policing published new guidance. Images placed on databases should meet proportionality and necessity criteria, and police should only use the LFR when other less intrusive methods are unsuitable, just like their shotgun dogs in the U.S., Likewise, the then UK Information Commissioner, Elizabeth Denham, issued a formal opinion warning against law enforcement using LFR for reasons of efficiency and cost reduction alone. Because, you know, these are devices and they fucking cost a lot. Guidance has also been issued on police using surveillance cameras, most notably the December 2020 Surveillance Camera Commissioner's Guidance for LFR and the January 2022 Surveillance Camera Code of Practice for Technology Systems Connected to Surveillance Cams. But these do not provide coherent protections on the individual right to privacy. So basically, it goes on to say that once a person is arrested, even if they're cleared, they remain a digital suspect, having their face searched again and again by LFR. This violation of privacy rights is exacerbated by data sharing between police forces. For example, a 2019 police report 
detailed how the Met and British Transport Police shared images of seven people with the King's Cross estate for a secret use of face recognition between 2016 and 18. And between 2016 and 19, the Met deployed LFR 12 times across London. The first came at Notting Hill Carnival in 2016, the UK's biggest African-Caribbean celebration. One person was a false positive. Similarly, at Notting Hill Carnival two, in 2017, two people were falsely matched and another individual was correctly matched, but no longer wanted. Big Brother Watch reported that at the 2017 Carnival, LFR cameras were mounted on a van behind an iron sheet, thus making it a se semi-covert deployment. Face recognition software has been proven to misidentify ethnic minorities, young people, and women at higher rates. And reports of deployments in spaces like Notting Hill Carnival, where the majority of attendees are black, exacerbate concerns about the inherent bias of facial recognition technologies and the ways the government use ampl amplifies police powers and aggravates racial disparities. So... <laughs> They, uh, they, they resumed use after suspending deployments during COVID-19, but we'll get that back, back to that a little bit later. And they deployed the LFR with a watch list of nearly, nearly 10,000 people. Four were arrested, including one who was misidentified and another who was flagged on outdated information. Similarly, a 14... Uh, July 2022 deployment outside Oxford Street tube station reportedly scanned around 15,600 people's data and resulted in four true alerts and three arrests. The Met has previously admitted to deploying LFR in busy areas to scan as many people as possible, despite face recognition data being prone to error. This can implicate people for crimes they haven't committed. So I thought I would say, like, bring this up to just highlight the fact that this technology doesn't even always reliably work and that it's a massive surveillance network that they can use to build watch lists and control entire populations. I thought I would bring that up because it's valuable to remember that uh, these robots can be equipped for automatic motion with facial recognition. They're building Skynet. And and like if if that's not if that's not enough proof, okay, then they already did it in China, which is a thing that I brought up in my uh, my my video over here um where I brought up that China was using facial recognition technology, and 5G to control entire areas. And that Palantir was effectively an information gathering app uh, started by uh, fucking Peter Thiel on the steering committee of the Bilderberg Group, who a lot of stupid coke to puss enabled libertarian cocksuckers still suck the cock of. Um... And, and he was doing this, like, trying to help them build databases like this for a long time. So it's valuable to remember that because this technology is here in the U.S. But let's go back to international for a second and, uh, and cover this, uh, this Indian uh, sort of controversy. Where a dystopian surveillance state is rising in India. And it's, it, it's all about how uh, they, they're persecuting minorities and using facial recognition to do it. And how the use of facial recognition had been initially sanctioned by India's top court in 2018 to trace nearly 3,000 missing children in the capital. However, authorities have gradually and illegally widened the use of this technology to curb dissent in recent years. It was deployed to surveil at least three major demonstrations in the absence of a data protection law in India. 
Quote, today there exists no remedy for the violation of many digital rights that emerge from the expansive collection and pro- pro- procession of personal data for India. Uh, Indians, states the Digital Rights Advocacy Group, Internet Freedom Foundation, or IFF. Quote, the existing legal vacuum on data protection pretends an Orwellian state and is clearly an infringement upon the fundamental right to privacy. And they're using it to discriminate against minorities because, hey, this, this facial recognition tech is, like, really good at discriminating against minorities. <laughs> of the more than 1.5 million CCTV cameras installed across 15 Indian cities, uh, Hyderabad and Chennai are among the highest surveilled cities with 375,000 and 280,000 cameras installed, respectively. According to cybersecurity research firm Comparatech, Delhi, with nearly 1,500 cameras installed per square mile, is the most surveilled city in the world outside of China. In August, authorities developed an additional face recognition system under disguise for the armed forces to identify individuals through face masks. That's right, they can see you through your mask, so all you, like, edgy anarchities who thought that this was an awesome opportunity to do a bunch of shit in a mask, congratulations, you might have self-incriminated. The state intends to expand its use in public places, which will raise the risk of intrusive data policing in the country. As the world's largest facial recognition surveillance system continues to be built, India plans to construct a centralized database threatening citizens' privacy. Targeted surveillance. It's a <laughs> In 2020, India witnessed the world's largest protest when authorities passed three controversial farm laws that brought fa- farmers from various states to Delhi's borders. The demonstration continued for nearly a year and was reportedly hijacked on 26-21, January 26, 2021, d- during a tractor rally at the historic Red Fort that took a violent turn. During the period, Delhi police claimed to use surveillance systems like facial recognition technology and drone mapping to track down the protesters on site. Does that sound fucking familiar? Does that sound familiar to the uh, to the, to the, to the anti like police brutality protests that were brought up in the other article I mentioned? Does that sound fucking familiar? Cuz it should. They're using this here in the same way, and this is considered Orwellian there. Why should it not be considered Orwellian here? According to the IFF, there are currently at least 124 ongoing facial recognition projects being developed and deployed by authorities that can cause irreversible harm. One place that India has been constantly monitoring with drones is the densely militarized Kashmir, after the Himalayan region was stripped of its special autonomous status in August 2019, the valley was put under complete lockdown, which was extended once the pandemic hit. Ha! Huh! It's almost like the pandemic was a mass excuse to, uh, I don't know, curtail citizens' rights and install systems that could further curtail their rights. Wow. Shucks. Shocker. Um... <laughs> which was extended once the pandemic hit. In December, the Modi administration announced new plans to deploy a facial recognition system and install nearly 300 CCTV cameras cameras in the summer capital of Sringar to preempt and prevent attacks on security forces by militants. Now, 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 they wouldn't do that here, would they? No, they would never do that here. They would never consider... Preventing attacks by militants using AI, right? Not like active fence, a thing I went over very recently, um, is being used by that sort of mentality and modality. Not like that's what they're doing. And not like they're muscling all of this in with little incentives. Like, hey, it'll make it easier for you to get into sports games. Mercedes-Benz Stadium in Atlanta to trial biometrics for entry. This was a thing a bit back where the NFL 
was trying to get people to accept fucking facial recognition uh, as the means to get into football games. It's how they're going to start muscling it in, guys. They're going to start muscling it in by getting people to accept it in exchange for easier entry to their favorite XYZ, whatever that thing is, right? And they're getting it from a young age, too. Like, they're training kids to handle it because Montana is using facial recognition in schools, monitoring children, monitoring fucking children, monitoring children in schools with facial recognition technology. This is a good time to bring back up the fact that if we d abolish the Department of Education, not only would conservatives not have to worry about what their kids are being taught, and, you know, they would have less excuse to be transphobic, but um, the, the, the left would, like, get their, their uh, whole, like, student loan forgiveness thing in spades because 92% are to the Department of Education. But, you know, aside from that, um, if we abolished the Department of Education, uh, kids wouldn't be being monitored by facial recognition fucking devices. I feel like it's, you know, something to bring up that maybe this isn't a good way to raise kids. Maybe. Right? Just a little bit of thought that might go into this could help a whole lot of kids not be surveilled and tyrannized from a very young age. But they don't want that because... Their plans have always been to instate a facial recognition super state. That's what it's always been, which is why, speaking of pandemics and what they were used for, remember these, or did you never hear about them? Because this new coronavirus spy drone will make sure you stay home. This was March 5th, 2020. For real, this is something that they did, and it was being compared to China because these things were started in fucking China. Almost like when I warned that, warned that the things that were done in China were going to be done here. They were going to be done fucking here. And almost like I've been talking about this for years because I was right about this and they were already going to start using Chinese tech in America. That's why this thing says Q coronavirus. If ever a country was fully prepared to establish who was where and when, me uh, meeting who and doing what, it's China. Let's face it, where else would we find phone tracking and facial recognition used at vast scale to monitor millions of people or citizens loading software onto smartphones that dictates whether or not um, they should be quarantined or allowed in subways, malls, and other public spaces? This has been effective. How effective, though, will be for history to tell once we have more transparency and data from the events of late 2019, early 2020, and it would be wrong to assume that what is taking place in China will not see parallels elsewhere. After all, we saw Singapore effectively contain the initial outbreak with a combination of strong policing and information transparency. And then we turn to the West, police standing guard outside a Tenerife hotel to enforce a quarantine, uh, strong arm policing as soon as it's deemed necessary. Action plans and emergency measures ready to be put into action. Before, uh, but for the pick of the coronavirus surveillance stories buzzing around this week, we need to go back to the source to China. The South China Morning Post reported on March 5th that the country is now adapting surveil uh, surveying, mapping, and delivery drones to enforce the world's biggest quarantine and to contain the coronavirus outbreak. When it comes to drones, there's no shortage in China. The country's electronics hub, Shenzhen, supplies as many as 70% of the world's civilian drones, and most of those used industrially in China. Now, South China Morning Post says the government has adapted and co-opted industrial drones to help ensure that an estimated 50 million residents who are kept at home are sorry, or sorry, who are, are kept at home and indoors across a dozen cities. Those industrial use cases have become a billion-dollar industry for Shenzhen. This is a new revenue stream. Clearly, the software on the drones is, in is not intended for population control and is so being rewritten to adapt their applications for disease detection and crowd management. 
Fortunately, the vehicles have thermal sensors, high-definition zoom lenses, and loudspeakers and chemical spray jets, which will all come in useful. And it's putting these in a variety of places, and it was totally okay with deploying them in America, because America had them. But, you know, if that's not enough, I also talked about how uh, I was right in the same year, and uh, an article that I put out uh, went over these RoboCop helmets, which were covered on the Free Thought Project after I brought up that the U.S. was going to start adapting Chinese technology, like their heads-up displays that tell cops who somebody is, like their criminal history, all that stuff, and whether or not they're a fugitive or wanted or whatever, surveillance technology mounted to their heads so that they can immediately be a part of a digital dystopia. Um, and I said that was coming to the U.S., and then months later, RoboCop is here. New police helmet scans for COVID-19 and uses facial recognition. Officials in Flint, Michigan have employed a new robotic helmet to ostensibly help police officers identify travelers who are sick with COVID-19. But it was totally about COVID-19, right? It wasn't about anything else? Sure. I believe you. I believe that the government didn't create a massive system of surveillance and control to make their jobs easier, and that they didn't use a pandemic to muscle this sort of thing through, and that they wouldn't use any other sort of similar emergency or emergency of a similar gravity um, to massively ramp up the amount of surveillance technology globally, and that they wouldn't use it in order to, you know create an internet of things in a new frontier. Sort of like a battlefield, maybe. An internet of battlefield things? <gasps> oh, shit! That's exactly what they did, and all with the help of Elon fucking Musk. Because, uh, let me bring up to you, that he has created the digital infrastructure for the war in Ukraine. Because... In February, they got Starlink Internet Terminals for basically free, funded by the West. And now uh, Elon Musk is pretending like a poor little hapless victim um, because this stuff that he was offering for free, basically, uh, was being paid for by U.S. contracts and the government doesn't want to do it anymore. And he doesn't want to do it anymore either, but he's making tweets on it, like, complaining about the fact that, oh, well, we're already running at a loss. You've been running at a loss forever, bitch. You rely on regulatory credits to stay afloat, which is where the government literally takes money from companies that aren't doing what you're doing and gives it to you. That's what you're doing, Elon Musk. So you, you're, you're already running at a loss, and without the help of the U.S. government at its launch facilities, you wouldn't be shit. So, basically, he installed Starlink so that the Ukraine's, uh, Ukraine government and Ukrainians could have it this whole time. Um, and now he wants U.S. funding of it because, you know, <laughs> he, he, he's been funding this for a significant period of time, but the U.S. has as well, and basically he just wants them to fund the whole thing. And... The U.S. is in touch with them, but basically, they've already been using it for the purposes of building <laughs> an Internet of Battlefield Things with distributed bot swarms that rely on this Internet in order to function. <laughs> and, and so, this was written in 2017. This has already been a thing for a long time. And recently, those of you who have been subscribed to this channel know that Google and a bunch of other people have been using this uh, war as an excuse to build their Internet of Battlefield things in Ukraine. So, let me just say that a, <laughs> a bot swarm partially fueled by drones that rely on the IoT technology that is being used to surveil every single other country, sure, that will never be brought here. Never. 
And it's not like they have technology here that is being literally weaponized against the American people in the form of shotgun robots or in the form of robot dogs with machine guns built on top of them, which I could have also included some footage of, and now I'm thinking I probably should have. But either way, that's being built here. The infrastructure is existing here. They are building Skynet here. But they're totally not going to use it for anything unconstitutional, unsavory, anti-liberty, or anything else. They're totally not going to build the inf Internet of Battlefield things here. No. So don't listen to me. Don't like, share, and subscribe. Don't bring up the fact that, uh, that the U.S. government is building robot guns to your family and friends. And certainly don't uh, support me in the links in description, sub to my email newsletter, or do anything else like that so that you can learn more about the ways that we need to smash the fucking state.